Actually, this session was inspired by the last panel, and actually the one called Bring Your Product Manager to the Open Source Party, which they had in Seattle. I was sitting there in my role as a product manager, and I thought I can tell a little bit more. So thanks for the inspiration to this. And yeah, let's see. I have a little bit the side from when you're not in this situation, like how do I do the upstream part? How do I prevent the maintenance that and so on? So I, I was more like, what happens? What brings you to open source? Because I'm coming from the automotive business. The automotive tries to do a lot of things in open source. They are jumping on a lot of initiatives, but actually they are very much NDA proprietary environment. So for this one, uh, yeah, it's maybe also a little bit of background. Just I work for ETAS. ETAS is not as known as Bosch. Bosch basically almost everybody knows with roughly 400,000 employees, many, many different areas in there, different products, not only automotive. And ETAS is more an automotive specific branch. Uh, they provide tools, boxes, things, analyzes, testing, so a lot of parts. Parts also open source projects and so on, but um, well, a little bit smaller part and I'm doing open source community work there. On top, I'm Elizar project member. I'm technical steering committee chair there. And for this, I, I make a little bit of advertisement on the next slide for this. Then I'm also in the Linux Foundation Europe advisory board currently, and I'm, we are in the open source world since many, many years, I guess my private infrastructure mainly runs open source, beside the things where I cannot avoid it. And uh, yeah, that said, just shortly, it's not about the topic, I guess there's not too many space people here, but if you are aware of potential people who are working on space side of life, or you're personally interested in space, it would be great to fill out a survey because we can look into a space grade Linux interest group in the ELISA project and try to support those people which are doing space. And I know typically the space talks on open source summits are more than crowded, so you hardly find a seat. So just, just as information, right. Then, uh, driven by the previous panel, we have some topics uh, which come up quite often when you talk about open source and then you get, reach out and say, well, what about this technology awareness? That's a big benefit because you just see what's happening. You get directly in contact with other companies, getting their product feelings, ideas. It can be your customers, which you meet, you meet competitors, you get some insights, which you normally don't get from web page analytics and so on. Uh, you can break up silos and figure out, hey, you know, we're sharing the same problem space and so on, uh, form potential partnership. But if it comes to the detail, it's not always easy to really quantify it in how many dollars does this conference bring you? And maybe you face the same issue some if you want to go to a conference and budgets are getting tight, then you may have like, why should you go there? It's not a direct business impact when you go to an open source conference or an area. Right. And what I want to point out is, uh, even if you're not contributing to open source, if you're new, new to open source, you can benefit from these things because there are booths, there are people, you have panels, you will see this person comes from this company, so you just go to the talk and up there. So even if you're not actively using it, but you know these are companies which are my competitors or companies which are my partners, companies which are my suppliers, you can benefit from this without doing anything about open source. So then something which you always have to address, the risk thing. At least this is something which in automotive pops up very often. I heard it from other industries as well. People come and say, well, if we use this software, we are liable for what we are doing. Well, what if something goes wrong? Can I also say, I would like to have a supplier and then I want to have unlimited liability. Uh, that's a topic which could come up as a risk. Then they say, okay, and I have no control. You know, these are people that do open source. I heard about it and these are all hobbyists and they do whatever they want. And so no, I don't want to go with open source. So I have no supplier management. And what about my schedules? You know, I'm a project manager, I'm a product manager, I have deadlines, I have quality measures, I have to fulfill standards. So what do I do? Uh, no, that's not good because I have no way in settling these things down. And then you say, oh, oh license obligation, oh, I need to publish things later on, oh, how do I do all these kind of things? And then to different countries, imagine I have to publish something and I there are the US tells me I shouldn't export something to uh, 
Iran or somewhere else. Like there's, there's like these rules, and then something should go to China, some others shouldn't go to China, to Asia, whatever you go in. Uh, North Korea, you have all those in there. So it export controls. People will see what you do. And well, then there's also fundamental just missing understanding, like I already said about the hobbyist part, and we know that there's a lot of professional work around open source, and basically when you do business, you will not look at the hobbyist project, you will look into something where companies invest, where companies work with, where maybe the maintainer is also paid by a company, at least this is for a lot of automotive stuff in there. So, but that's not what I want to talk that much about, but that's the first question is like, ooh, I see all these risks. And there's naturally tendency, at least what I saw, almost just, just to step away and say, leave me alone with the thing. And then the question comes, why do we end up with open source software at all? It's because reality hits you. And I took this from another presentation. So it's looking a little bit from the style. Typically, we operate in projects. Projects have a certain lifetime. And this lifetime is dictated by a schedule. You never bother about the schedule because you have infinite resources and budget, right? No, you don't. So someone took away your budget. And then you say, but it doesn't matter. I have so many skilled engineers. I just let them train all this proprietary stuff, which we're doing. So I just get another 100 engineers because they're also for free. No, it's all limitations which you have. <laughs> and this is basically the three elements which you always operate. And also from a product management side, you think about your schedule my time to market and all this, how much cost do I spend on the whole thing, and which people can I make use of. And by this, you end up and say, I cannot do all this. I cannot re-implement everything, even if I see something which could be a solution fit from an open source, so I don't get in there. And the next slide will be challenging, because it's a bit small. I don't know if I can read everything properly from my little screen. This is some additional work which we saw from automotive perspective. So uh, we see that we are operating in such an environment and because we cannot develop everything else and we see that, for example, buy-in by a supplier is cheaper than developing on your own. That's what you typically do in a make buy analysis and so on. You will go, but then you end up with proprietary parts. And this is not standard technology, which means it creates a certain vendor login. So you really depend on the ecosystem and uh, the set be careful when you potentially even go for an open source solution and just trust in this open source supplier on it. Uh, we were once building work with a Yocto part and one of our supplier just tightly coupled the scripts and everything around it like this tightly that we were never able again to change to another Yocto version just because the scripts were so tightly coupled to all the rest. So this could be, so you need to see how do you get the suppliers in um, yeah, then source code transparency is something you end up with just with binaries. Then you have the concern it's maybe a smaller company. So you, how do I get later on to the source code for it? And uh, then you start with escrow agreements. You put the source code into uh, This was actually what I had 15 years back. We put source code into a safe for a company. So they made a download of the version, put the source code into a safe. And then whenever this company would be bankrupt, whatever, we get the key to the safe to open it and get the source code out of it. So uh, <laughs> like this, it's very funny, but this was how it was. Um, skilling is a problem because automotive is full of proprietary tools. You have freshers from university, they got all these fancy things and then they're suddenly confronted with Autosar, which is like the microcontroller things from 15 years back, which is really a good business. It's still a business of eaters, so I don't say much about this. We, we sell Autosar still on microcontrollers because the whole automotive industry depends on it. And uh, yeah, and then we figure out it doesn't scale. So you also think about interdependency. And there's a lot of ways where the open source part can help you. So this is maybe some part where you can just initiate the discussion and say, here's your problems. Here's something where open source address this. And uh, like we had this open standards part. This was in the previous panel, I guess. Then. Uh, diverse environment, vendor independability. So you could consider before I buy a proprietary software, I go with open source. And even if I cannot maintain it on my own or can upstream, I can still contract someone and have a chance to contract another one. Uh, as a concrete example, we had this, that we were working with a longtime partner also on Linux. 
products and we wanted to look for something new with a new generation of software and we got the first offer with our known partner and then we said oh let's do an RFQ and just go into different companies <coughs> and just by opening this RFQ with other companies which could provide a solution for this Linux based software product parts we reduced our or the price the cost of the original vendor who still got the offer later on by 50 percent so he was just reducing price to half because he wanted to stay in the business he knew what he had with us and then he just went significantly down with the offer because he knew that there are other industry partners which are just taking less and we didn't know <laughs> so we got it by answering and I, i've written to 10 companies or so so that's something which you get and uh, yeah then the skill login which we had for the people of course if you have common frameworks you much easier find uh Linux developer than the Autosar developer, that's what I mentioned. Even if you look on BlackBerry QNX, it's very much used in automotive. Even there, you don't find too many developers and they need to train, they need to learn it. And it's not attractive partially. I mean, an Autosar developer, which is doing it for 10 years, will hardly get somewhere else, if not Autosar, because there is no chance in putting it to somewhere else. All you did is still a long learning curve. Right. and. Yeah, I put some quotes down there, which we really got from interviews with uh, car manufacturers, which were, and also tier ones, which we really just said this is what we have. Uh, they were very afraid of putting open source code in the car, didn't understand it, and uh, who is taking the liability. So we have all these kind of concerns, right? And one thing from my product management time, then, so now we go really much closer to the original tools box. Uh, how do we traditionally approach so automotive industry software development? We do a make or we do a buy. And we actually have a <coughs> template where I say these are my main, so I did a rough architecture for my product. What do I need in this product? So I write down the different stack parts, blocks, and then I can select. It's an Excel sheet because uh, we, really, we really love Excel sheets. You can on uh, this multi-selection mode, you can say make. Mm, no, I don't make it. Buy. Well, I want to use open source. What do I say? And I like, I went up with buy. And I thought, okay, when I now put buy in there, how do I show the problem? I put, what does it cost? Nothing. Because I was quite, we just want to take a tool like, I had a nice evening talk yesterday, so we'll just take this product. I want to take Jupyter Notebook for some part of my documentation part. I will not upstream anything i will just take it as is and it's part of my documentation and i don't need this so i just take this tool so zero and then the people came oh yeah i i did a check on your excel sheet and um here you see you said you will buy it say so, yes but you say zero cost i said it's for free how can it be for free it's open source project you just download it it's for free no costs so you're making it no no i don't make it i just installed it and it's done and this is how we just started the whole thing and say oh okay so we can integrate things we can collaborate on work and that's just how the whole story started and i thought like oh if this is just one tool what other tools are there which kind of toolbox do we have and i couldn't talk about everything because i have the tendency to talk more than i want so i reduced the slides a little bit uh, one thing which I like as a beginning is to just talk about Pastel. This helps you in a lot of environments. Uh, yeah, SWOT analysis, Kano model. Kano model is actually one which I like a lot. And I try, so the slides are uploaded and you find all the uh, links and also if there's a Wikipedia article or so, I'm not telling any secrets here, you can just read also on your own. Uh, a little bit of Tom Sound Sound, that's also something which I learned to like, and I figure out it's independent of open source business or so. It makes sense to really look into market and don't cheat yourself by saying, oh, I have such a cool, great idea. I tweak the number that it looks promising so that the management is convinced. Uh, I had one project last year where I just did a calculation. It sounds so obvious. It was some kind, some car camera system, and it's just growing. It's got more important than other parts. And then I just calculated the numbers and said, okay, um, how many cars do we actually produce worldwide? And I took the car number and there it does. I said, okay, uh, how many are in my market area? What are the classes, right? It's just car goes from mass entry car to luxury car. And okay, where do this project will end up? And I figured out by the year 2030, 
I would have needed another use case for my software, which is running on the in-car camera, for another camera use case. Otherwise, I would never get a return of invest, even with utilizing the open source parts. And it's just like cross-checking these numbers. So that's why I bought this in. I have a little preview slides also for the right side. Maybe I have a chance to give another presentation if someone said that was useful. And uh, let's start with a pastel. Uh, there's also past and other words on it. So go to the Wikipedia past analysis page and you get all this differentiation. You can also give, create new words out of it, but uh, pastel is what you can see on the right side. That's what came out. And I think it's, it's a good point. So it provides you a holistic view on what you have to think about when you go into a product, like political situations. Um, we're coming from automotive field and you want to do autonomous driving. Autonomous driving has cameras. Cameras get connected to the cloud. You want to have data usage. Uh, and then you need to know if you are in China close to governmental districts, you're not allowed to upstream data to the cloud. You're no longer allowed to process license signs. You're no longer allowed to have picture of humans in there. So this is something which you need to know. Or you may end up in countries where they demand that you have local service where you upload your software to, so that they say, because they believe there could be geolocatical blockings, and then they say, if you have your software, the software may not be in Europe for a product which is being released to some other country. So these are things where you look at and they can make up your mind, or also what I mentioned with the export control, like for legal part, it's here, consumer laws, how is liability handled, or also where do I put things? And if I just put it on a European server or a US server, it may be that it falls under export control still because it's accessible from other countries. And if there's a certain level of IP in there, and this is all things which goes into this pastel analysis, but that's also training where yeah, product manager typically are aware of. So they just get trained on what is in there. You can also read through it and it's not too many parts and therefore the open source where you also just say, okay, that's in there. But you could, for example, save cost if you just say, I can lose, use a local infrastructure for putting my source code there, then I don't need to make up my mind where it is and I can only do this with open source. I wouldn't put the proprietary things there. So I don't need to make also my mind up on, okay, it's this country infrastructure. So how do I pay over the long run? Will the service be available? And so on. So it's something which you can in, do in. Right. Uh, second one on SWOT analysis. I had times filling this one. I still like it a lot. Um, especially this, you can see it. It has internal origin and external origin. And open source combination with internal origin is something which doesn't give you a direct fit because open by nature is more external than internal. Um, from strengths, what you can see is that you can show skill sets from the internal. We would be in this marketing perspective, open source branding, company branding, going outside, reduce cost there. And the panel sat in the panel, they were saying, thing that just that, uh, consider your marketing efforts, affairs, and so on. Actually, these fields, all this listed, are parts of a business case. So you can say, what is my communication strategy? And if I have a deep technology stack, maybe I do it like Wind River does now and uh, go with my Alexir to a conference. I haven't seen them the last time as being a sponsor, but now they are sponsor because they have a product. It's a Linux space. They combine cloud to Ash, so they find a perfect audience with the Alec with Linux conference uh, or embedded Linux conference, Linux con other parts here. This could be something. Uh, for the weakness part, you address the parts like Autos are experience you don't have so you can say where can I fill missing competencies uh, or I have slow <coughs> development where can I speed up development by just taking pre-existing parts so this would be something which is harmful to you because it directly impacts your potential market if you don't have the skills if you don't have the schedule mat and I guess these two are also ones which I quite often see when you do risk analysis and coming out of a SWOT then you end up in this slow development parts. <laughs> Opportunities, of course, gaining new customers. So uh, an example, I, I mentioned China several times, it's just because my, my camera system went into this Chinese direction. 
why so? I learned that 80% of the autonomous driving or the cars in China with driving system systems run on Linux, right? And actually the Chinese government said that they would make more use of domestic software. At least that's what I heard from the regional branch in China. They said, the government says, we want to be more independent. We want to use sovereignty and be, the, or be sovereign and then have domestic software. And guess what? Open source software is treated like domestic. It's not domestic because it's open, but it's seen as domestic because it's fully accessible. So this could be something like, oh, where does this bring in? Uh, then opportunities is something which is overseen like additional business because a lot of open source also belongs to services. How can I add longer maintenance? How do I just have my open source base stack add sync on top? So this is something which uh, falls directly into the business case for additional monetization aspects and which is just with your traditional product sometimes harder to see. Get early feedback and uh, yeah, threats. It goes in the risk field, but uh, you should see, so we often do competitor analysis. That's one of the tools which we have where we just say, where are our main competitors? What we oversee is sometimes, is there already an open source solution available which can do the job? And you can also say it in the other way around, do I have a very strong competitor and do I have a product on my own which is doing the job quite good, but not as much as I would expect, and sorry, this is not in the open source culture at the end, it's more on the product management side. I can just do open source guerrilla tactics and just open source it. I can destroy business of others, like they could destroy my business if I'm not careful. And it's not an unlikely scenario if we are now seeing for automotive, there's software defined vehicles, so everybody pushes in, uh, you're doing blind open sourcing for some parts, where you just say, okay, I want to be part of this game, so I'm open sourcing my stack, which I don't have made money yet with. And then maybe someone else just sat on the horse and uh, tried to get in there. Right. Uh, single supplier open source. This is some thread which I want to mention on the other side because we have quite some companies which do single vendor open source. Uh, I guess you're all aware of that. I don't need to mention the examples with them even also with the open source pro search project, right? That's the same story. Good. And now one of my favorite ones the uh, Kano model, the base thing behind is that you are sometimes, so it's a question when I don't write down the questions, but typically you ask, you interviews, you ask questions to people, and one thing which you ask is like, what if you would see feature X? And how would you be lighted or not? So you get this scale. And then you say on the other side, what would be in the absence of this feature? Which sounds like strange, but it's, uh, like just asking the yes and no questions, so just putting the not in there. And by this, the model is explained in detail. You can see uh, what are then the lighters, what could be a competitive advantage, what could be a unique selling point, and what will be then later, what could be base functionality, right? It's something which the customers don't care about. If it's there, they wouldn't recognize when it's up then, but you know you anyway have to fulfill it because there are certain obligations. And this is coming up, for example, with the CRA, right? Whenever you get into legislations, policies, and so on, you have a very strong drift from the top down to basic needs. And this should always ring a bell and say, can I collaborate, cooperate on something? Because there will be others which share my burden. And yeah, I guess this is the basic thing. Did I mean anything? No. Right. Basic needs, yeah, that's the one which really are things which everybody does. And a good indicator also is, I mean, I come from, a, as I Bosch at my mother company with 400,000 employees, which run different business units. Uh, we typically perform an activity map and it also applies to other companies. It's sometimes nice to have this if you have uh, different business units, areas in the panel it was like with Amazon having parts, AWS, and so on. Uh, I don't know if it's too diverse, but for our side, from Bosch side, we build devices. And we have, for example, uh, gardening equipment, where you have this electric mowing 
or is it mower, whatever, this little robot to cut your grass. And we have vacuum cleaner robots. And if you just take both of them, these are typically driving, rotating things with a little bit of sensor data. One gets in the dust, the other one cut the grass. Uh, so it makes sense to check in these kind of activities and then figure out what are commonalities. And if you find more examples and figure out, I have like six, seven activities which have a common ground, you should really consider, is this something differentiating for what your product or is this a base feature? And if I already find it internally, I may look in the outside because there are others which are doing the same thing. And and also, where is really the value which you get? What do you want to get? Where, what do the customers like to see? And can I engage much better with the customers if I add this? Technology stack, this is maybe the nearest thing. Basically, what do you use in? Which technologies do you need? Um, we have the fin, FinTech quite much growing with a lot of open source things in there, right? And I think Gap was saying several times, if you can bring open source to finance, you can bring open source everywhere. But you need to see what is the unique selling point for all the fintech parts and where do they rely on a lot of infrastructure and where they have built these closed environments 30 years back, starting with programming language, which nobody speaks anymore and can write. So there was a shift and the demand and need to just go forward. And this could be something which you see also in there and saying what is the technology stack and where do I really need it. The partner network you can also see because maybe your activities around already partner with something and for example we have a magnitude of project working with Yocto and we see that the Yocto project sometimes get different sourcing because you have your own little business unit, your team and so on and they say oh, I found this company which can support me, I found this company and we for example had a case where we saw that we were both both business units were working on the same chipset and the one contracted Colabra, the other contracted Amarula and then we just combined the upstreaming effort for the same chipset and uh, had just half the efforts. All right, there's some further topics which typically come in activity maps. We're looking like what is the status? Is it a discontinued project? Is it active? Is it just ramping up? And uh, what the market access of the way how you get in? This, we, I don't touch that much because it's nice, but it's not always really related to the open source part. What you should be aware of, uh, if you have a very diverse company, you could say, well, I don't care about this cloud things. I just need cloud. My more part is the data. So I uh, just open source everything around it. We know there's all this open source thing there, but you may have another part of your business where you say, oh, we just create a product around it to have this infrastructure. So it's better not to open source. So you should see, is there something else? And this finally fits into like the tam sum sum, which is the uh, total available market. That's what's or addressable market depends on which model you take. The end result is the same. It's like, what do I see? Is it the universe? How do I scale down? It's tricky part is what is the proper sizing? So uh, when I had this case with the camera part in the car, I don't take all cars. I just started with what are you know, sort of what I take where image processing is in and then narrow it down and say, okay, can my solution fit to image processing, which could be a radar sensor, lidar sensor, and cameras, or is it really a solution for just cameras? Okay, it's camera. So I took my market size on the camera market, everything which has a camera, and said, but my solution fit, where does it fit? So the service available market, assuming there's no competitor around, this would be then the sum and you say, okay, this is just the in-dash camera. And then the next level is like, what is the realistic market size? And this should be really like, be realistic on what's in there. What can you achieve? And it also means looking bottom up, which competencies do I have? Which skills are there? Which technologies do I use? Is the technology available? How long does it take to develop? How can I scale? And asking these questions already point you to the open source parts. So, uh, the make or buy part things come in, where can I use the other parts? Um, is open source enabling or preventing me from additional markets? It can enable me for China and maybe somewhere where they say it's not accepted. I don't know where actually it prevents you. It's a little bit for crypto. If you have crypto technologies 
and do mu too much open source, this can really give you pain on export controls, but sometimes it can release your pain of export controls if you directly use an existing crypto library and do all work upstream, but don't do local forks and just pull this project in. So then you have much easier ways on redistribution. And yeah, for some, you can play a little around with the tools which you use. For many people, tools are non-differentiating parts. For others, they make business with it. For example, Etos sells a lot of tools if we just open all the tools. It gives me a hard discussions if, it, if it's IP or not, because for one, the product is IP. I said, where's the sense in it? I see these tools around there. Then they show me how much money they can make. And I said, OK, let's just wait until the others identify there's something open source, but let's make money with it for now. That's also quite nice. And here at the end boss, which you then have all the informations which you take are getting into uh, the business case calculation to so this little bit in the background. Uh, you can see typically we take something like 10 years scale. We look into the next 10 years, how will market grow and so on. And you see a little bit also in gray as a sum. So you have this sum, sum, sum parts, you calculate what is your SGN A additional, what is management cost, but also what is the infrastructure cost, marketing cost, technology costs. And bringing in open source there is sometimes a little bit tricky. For example, we have like where you can have cost savings and I can put in a field there and say, I save 5 million in license cost. And it doesn't influence my business case to any extent because they would like to see how much profit you make. And at the end you can say, well, if I save 5 million, it's profit, but it's not counted in the calculation. So something which could came up is like, we just make a row and such, well, this is like cost savings in, the, in another field and say, we don't pay the license of X. Instead, uh, we just pay the maintenance effort and the further development and give a little number. And the differentiating part will be then just, we save, we gain $2 as additional money. And by this, we could really draw something up and create and figure out how much can we gain as value by replacing some proprietary task with open source. And due to the, actually in our case, we figured out, okay, we need to have a proprietary base. We need to maintain this. And a large scale, the product scales quite well because we can make use of <coughs> Linux, give it to other parties. And suddenly I had an EBIT range uh, coming up to 90%, which means 10% cost, 90% pure benefit just for the license cost savings from this proprietary software tool. And uh, this was a little bit much. So I checked also, I found some flaws because I missed some maintenance, right? The maintenance hurdle, we need to get this thing. We talk about local patching and so on. And I added values on this. Still, I end up with like 50%, something for this concrete use case. And what you get then with efficiency gains, time to market, reuse potential. And what we did actually from a bottom-up approach was we were looking into what have we done once and what if we reuse because we had a project, an initiative, which really just concentrated on the open source parts. And this basically then said, um, we, in average, we came to a 30% cost reduction for a lot of overall in the thing. So I, this is always my basically rule of thumb calculation thing. If I get a business case calculation where things get in and say, okay, where have you replaced parts? Where can I do this? And it's because you know technology, because you can make use of it, uh, it goes all in this. And 30% is a nice thing. So if you say, let's challenge what you have, if you want to go with a product manager and say, explain you what you have done, show me what you have, and I'll see what I find in the open. And I get, we see what we can save. And if we can save something, I get 10%, 20%, 15%. Let's see how much, which I can invest. And there was the saying, invest back to the community. And you should always say something about responsibility back or so. You need to see it's really, you invest in there. And it's a commercial effort. You can even use risk reduction and really show like what could be if there is no one. You can say, what if your supplier is gone? And then you are at the beginning of the presentation again with like, oh, all these risks. And you say, yeah, but you have to handle this risk. And you end up with these things for non-measurable work. 
which we have, which you can turn into numbers and say, what is the comparable stack? What are, how much is my supplier market? What are there? And then it plays always in the hands of time, cost, and resources. I'm perfectly in this four, 34 minutes of my 40, I guess. I guess I hope I had 40. So this just risk management thing I put in, you can download it. Uh, regulatory requirements, a little bit about this. Uh, what's the board server location? I touched it also. Competitor analysis, very nice. We touched slightly on this. Um, it's the wider scope of the activity maps. And if you are really funny, you will then fill a business model canvas where you look into partners, activities, and so on. And as Marcel promoted, uh, if you don't want to wait for so long, get in touch with to-do group efforts on the open source business side. Uh, also in the slides, I hope I've uploaded this one because I edited it after reviewing from Marcel. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. Okay, any question? Oh, good. Yeah, one. Um, you have mentioned in the Thompson song yeah. saying that, like, the real estate. Do you have any insights or, like, advice on, like, how to, like, maybe some benchmark to check yourself? Your oh, yeah. Um, to, like, what is realistic? Like, what is realistic? Yeah. Um, what what is sometimes the market size which you see and you could just say okay you estimate a market size and you can say what previous products which we have and which market size do we realistically gain so this is one element and then for the thumb part there is a lot of studies also so research reports like how much is the car industry changing how much is the cloud native changing what are new trends what is ai trends take them with care and a grain of salt because they are also not accurate and they are just looking into the like crystal ball future but this helps from another perspective and what helped me was to just like from the activity map talk with other people because for this camera use case i had a very big flaw in my business case calculation i calculated the camera parts and i talked to another person then who was from another field but doing like marketing and i said check how many cameras they count cameras but they're not counting control units and you will place it on a control unit and if there's like one camera at the driver and one camera at the occupants then you have two cameras and your market is shrinked by half <laughs> this was my failure which i did <laughs> so I, I just calculated how many cameras are in there and then subtracted the outside ones remain true in them, but i just took it at all single systems so this is something where you can just ask someone who is in the product to similar related projects and we say from your ecosystem this really helps yeah. and this helped me to get to a realistic business case and see that i had to add more use cases and otherwise will not survive with my product idea yeah one back Uh, the, I actually, so the question is if I add additional efforts for open source compliance, yeah, just repeating because the virtual audience and later on down here. So what their additional efforts for open source activities, compliance, um, general, general, yeah. The thing is, um, yes, kind of for the compliance explicitly, uh, because we have like an overall, due to the Bosch side, there is compliance handling, there are scanning, there is open source available and by this, uh, it runs under certain SGNA costs, so they I have to anyway have factor, and then it's just split to along, so you can benefit or you don't benefit. Uh, actually, you don't have a chance to reduce your SGNA, say because I don't use open source, I don't pay in it because it's just like spread over lost part. This is for my area, and yeah, when I had this ninety percent uh, abit, so earnings before incomes and taxes, this was something where I originally missed some part of what is the upstream what is the maintenance and they say okay i may do a kernel update and some point of time this could cost me x and gives a higher risk so uh and this was then reducing so i i added this with these points and then you of course you need to make a best guess what it costs and i could actually even put in community efforts in so just something like hiding money this was also the question in the panel before how do you get money in from the savings which I gained, the people didn't believe me in the savings which I did, so I just did something where I said, okay, yeah, then we can pay the membership and this and that. And 
uh, project membership. It's not much more expensive sometimes than maintaining a server, so so even can cover these costs. And it's not it's in a tendency to cheating, but it's just like it's not cheating because you should do it as a risk management. Yeah. Official time is over, I guess. Any final question? One final question. Uh, Uh, that's a good point. From the embedded space <laughs> where I did the device parts, uh, there was a little bit less effort in this, but I, and for the XE issue, for example, which is a, which could happen to basically every project, right? Um, this was something which didn't come up, but we have the issue before. We don't need to wait for an XE attack or so because uh, our suppliers sometimes are already attacking us without we're identifying it right. They are doing a cheating result in this. So no, I, I didn't put these parts into consideration. That's a good point. I will see if I can quantify or bring this in. Yeah. Then finally, thanks. <laughs>